This is Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. But that's a good book, Louis Armstrong, his own words. And then Mr. Brothers also came out with Louis Strong, New Orleans. Hi, R2. Oh, Mr. Tom Brothers. How Hi. you doing, sir? I'm Hi. glad, man. I'm improv man. I'm living in private. Living <laughs> up. How you doing today, sir? I'm doing real well. How are you? I, I was glad it made this work. You wouldn't believe the story I had to tell you if, I, if you knew how I had to get this phone communication up, this radio show today. Okay. And I just love to have you on. Can you please explain yourself? Yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself, Mr. Brother. <laughs> well, I'm a musicologist here at Duke University. I teach um, in two areas. I teach African American music history, and I teach uh, late medieval French music. Mm-hmm. And so that's those are my two areas that I do research in, and I teach regularly. And uh, as you know, I've been working with Louis Armstrong's music for a long time now. <laughs> And I published a couple books on him. One was an edition of his writings that came out in 1997 called mm-hmm. Louis Armstrong in His Own Words. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the other is the book that um, we're going to talk about today, Louis Armstrong's New Orleans, which I'm happy to say just uh, this week came out in paperback. Oh, congratulations on that, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I'd like to understand, like, why is it so important? Because I read your book, the, the recent book. I also read the other one back in 2003. It really changed my mind and life about how I perceive you, Mr. Louis Armstrong. Uh huh. And I love the way you wrote the book because you also you came from like I said you were musicologist, but also you approached in the way you broke it down where people could actually understand Louis Armstrong as a person. Mm-hmm. Can you please explain how you do that and why you chose to write in that fashion or style? What was so important about that? Uh, you talked about Louis Armstrong in his own words. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, it's it's a long story actually. Um, he, you know, he died in 1971, and then his widow died uh, in the early 80s. Mm-hmm. And and then it, people gradually uh, found out that when it, after his widow died that he had left a lot of writings behind. It was kind of amazing because, I mean, it was amazing in the sense that people didn't think of him as a writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, his, his whole personality and his persona was sort of uh, played towards the natural side and uh, not a very sophisticated side, and people just didn't think of him as a literate person, uh, according to his stage persona. So it was it was surprising to a lot of people that, that that he was so interested in writing, and really, for a long time, he traveled with uh, a typewriter all the time, and and mm. uh, during the downtime backstage, he w- he just loved uh, writing letters and writing memoirs, and and so he left a lot behind, actually. And so um, I was then eventually this material that he had written and, and a lot of other material too, uh, tapes. He put a lot of he put up some 500 uh, reel-to-reel tapes together wow. over the course of his last few years, last 10 years or so. All of that now is in Queens at Queens College Louis Armstrong House and Archive, which mm. is a wonderful place. Next time you get to Queens, New York, <laughs> go go and you can visit his house, which is now a national uh, historic landmark. It's really done nicely. It's a beautiful place and in the middle of a working class neighborhood in Queens and, and it's really a fun visit. Anyway, this archive acquired all these, these writings that I'm talking about in, yes, addition, in addition to the tapes and, and in the early 90s I was able to gain access to them. And, and as I did, uh, first of all, it was astonishing how much was there and how, how interesting it was across a, a wide range of topics. Um, and then what was also fascinating is the idiosyncrasies of his style of writing. Uh, as you can imagine, he's a very inventive person and, and a person who really um, has a sense of stylizing himself. And a lot of that comes through in the writings. Uh, inventive words, um, inventive phrasing, irregular punctuation, and, and so forth. And, and so we preserved all that in the addition of, of his writings. We didn't change any, we didn't edit it away, as, as had usually been the case. You know, there's the, there's the famous autobiography that he wrote, Satchmo, um, My Life in New Orleans, Mm-hmm. which uh, was published in the mid-1950s. 
And I've yeah. actually seen the, the TypeScript that he wrote for that, that, that was turned into the book. And as you can imagine, it was edited pretty heavily so that a lot of these quirky idiosyncrasies and turns of phrase and uh, just very distinctive, uh, a lot of personality in his writings, a lot of that was eliminated. So in our edition from 1997, um, we, we kept all that, and, and that was one of the really nice things about the book is that you could just have direct access. I mean, we cleaned it up a little. You're correct, you know, there, there, it's, right. not, it's not a literal transcription of what he wrote, but... But that's a very a fun part of the book. So did he, uh, will you say that he wrote the way he played his trumpet on Scott Sing? I mean, yeah. the, the original? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he may not have been as brilliant of a writer as he was a musician. It would be, <laughs> yeah, right. it would be unusual if he was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he is, I would say, that among the great jazz players, he is by far the most prolific writer. Uh, has left behind the most things that so and and there's this real sense in the last ten years of his life especially that he's really trying to document the historical record. He's trying to let people know he's writing this for for us for his for mm -hmm. future people who are interested in him, and he really wants them to know his point of view, how how he saw things, what what you know his honest unvarnished opinion, and that really comes through in the writings. I think it's interesting, like, you know, I'm speaking, like, you, like your, let, your second book came out right after the new, uh, like, the Katrina fiasco. Yeah. And, I, you know, everybody was talking about Kanye West when he made a statement about George Bush, doesn't care about black folk. But I like to talk about Louis Armstrong with the Little Rock Nine when he basically canceled his State Department tour. So he yeah. said, I need to do something about them boys and girls down there getting, you know, messed with. Yeah. So I thought that was very brave for him to come out and, like, you know, this is McCarthyism era in the 50s, you know, to make that type of statement, but he still got criticized. Like, why do you feel that people still are kind of conflicted by Louis Armstrong's personality? I mean, Miles Davis spoke about it, you know, and then, you know, you had Bill Holiday say, well, he's just coming from the heart, like, he really loved mm. Louis Armstrong. Why do you think that people are still kind of put off by his personality? Well, when he grew up, uh, in, the, in the environment he grew up in, I mean, First of all, you have to understand that this is a person whose education stopped at age 12. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's not a highly educated person in school. Um, and when he grew up was the period uh, that, you know, the first two decades of the century, of the 20th century, is uh, thought of by most historians as to be the absolute worst period in the nation's history for uh, racial oppression. Mm -hmm. And, and he, this was the time when all of Jim Crow laws were put in place, this was the time when lynchings, the number of lynchings, were peaking throughout the Deep South. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a this was a horrible time for African Americans uh, to to live and and to grow up in that kind of environment. Um, you know, I mean, th there are certain ways of dealing with that environment that that you internalize, or he, at least he internalized. And um, cert and and also, as he became a professional musician. Certainly, he internalized a certain way of acting on stage, a way of being deferential to whites, um, and so forth, that, that was part of his stage persona. So in the 50s, the period you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, you know, his audiences, he would, that was the period when he was bursting across the American scene. Mm -hmm. he, he was packing in audiences everywhere he went, and largely white audiences. I mean, he had black audiences, but up until, I would say, from the 20s to the 30s, his audience was largely black. Then in the 30s, he starts to attain more and more white audiences. In the mid-30s, especially, by the 30s, he has uh, both black and white audiences. And during the 40s, it, it, he's no longer as cutting edge in, within the black community and people like... Well, eventually in the early 50s, Ray Charles and, mm -hmm. and um, Muddy Waters, you could say, um, uh, rhythm and blues, all that kind of thing. Black audiences are going more for that kind of music. Uh, and, and he's really um, growing in his white audiences. So, he, And oh, he's also in a lot of movies. He's a very famous person in the 1950s. So as you can imagine, someone in that position, it, you know, it, it can work both ways. You, you, you look at someone in, in that position, you expect them to speak out. You expect them to say, take a stand and not play for segregated audiences, which, which some entertainers chose to do in the 1950s. He did not chose to do that. He continued to play for segregated audiences. But then all of a sudden, out of a blue, comes this remark that you're referring to about the Little Rock incident and Governor Favis, and he's saying... Uh, 
uh, Eisenhower has, has no guts. I mean, it was an outrageous statement that he made, it very, very assertive, and it got plastered all over the front pages of, of a lot of uh, entertainment newspapers and so forth. Very controversial and, and very risky, very risky for, for that period. Armstrong uh, went through a lot of risks in the late 50s. Uh, there were bomb threats at some of his concerts because he was playing with an integrated band, which, which was in itself a controversial thing to do, especially in the mm-hmm. South. <clears throat> so it was. It were hot times, you know. They were. They were difficult times, and and I mean, this is not someone who was, uh, you know, highly educated, as I say, and had a sense of of dealing with uh, the white business world. He relied on white managers to deal with those kinds of things as intermediaries for him, and uh, really preferred not to uh, control a lot of the business side of his career. He preferred to just to leave that in, in the hands of managers. So to take this kind of assertive of role in politics was, was really shocking. And his, his managers, in fact, tried to deny that he had ever said that and, mm. and uh, tried to cover up for it and sweep it away. But he, but he stuck to it, actually. He, he, in a series of, of follow-up stories, he said, you know, explained why he said that and what he meant by it and, and what he thought should be done. Yeah, I like to go follow up on Armstrong because I use his relationship with white people or dealing with white people. It's like, you know, he had these string of managers that really mistreated him. But, like, you know, I think you made a point to talk about, you know, what Black Benny told him in his letters or whatever. Like, you know, I mean, I heard Tony Benny said that he actually told Queen Elizabeth II the same story. Well, basically, like, you know, uh, you got to find a white man that really likes you or respects you, that takes up for you, and you become that white man's nigger. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was very telling. Like, I mean, I thought he was very, like, in a way, sophisticated, you know, to understand, yes. like, the dynamics. Like, you know, you, you know, if you don't work, you don't eat. Yes. So he understood that it was so important to have that relationship, but at the same time, like, you know, he grew up in the South, like you said, in the segregated South, and, and one of the worst periods of American history, we had, like, black people basically getting lynched every day and a half somewhere in this country. Yes. You know, for, spect- for spectator sport. And so, like, I mean, I just think that's interesting, like, how he was able to navigate those worlds. Yes. At the same time. But, you know, I think he was hurt. Like, you made a point. I mean, I think a lot of people know that he was hurt when he lost a lot of his black audience, because, I mean, is it fair to just Louis Armstrong by our standards, like what innovation is, because like what he wanted to do was you know, bring people joy. Yeah. He didn't care about necessarily being cutting edge, but you listen to some of the stuff he did in the twenties, like his trumpet solos are so still relevant and up to date. You know, it's crazy. Yes, yes. I mean, um, I agree with you completely. I mean, here what you realize first of all, the more you um, learn about Louis Armstrong, is even though this is a person whose education stopped at age twelve. He's mm-hmm. a very intelligent person, <laughs> mm-hmm. very, very perceptive, very knowing, and and, uh, and very nimble-minded, you know, very adaptable, and, and learns and knows how to work social situations and knows how to negotiate things. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's strategic and he's skillful in, in dealing with all these complexities. And as you say, um, musically, in the 1920s and the early 1930s especially, uh, he is the number one. I mean, he is the person every jazz musician is looking at and modeling their music on. I, mean, I don't know if everybody realizes that. Maybe maybe people know that more than they used to know it. But he, Because a lot of people know him from his image in the 50s and the 60s, which is very, very different. But in the, in the 20s and the early 30s, he is cutting edge. He, he is showing the world, really, and the whole world, I mean, Europe and uh, different places in the world are paying attention. They're, he's showing them how to, to play jazz, you know, how, how to improvise jazz. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of musical intelligence that takes is, is pretty obvious, I guess. I mean, you, have, you can't do something like that without being a pretty intelligent person. Let me ask you this. Like, I want to touch bases on you. Is this like Louis Armstrong, New Orleans? Is that the companion book? Is it kind of part of an like, installment project with the Louis Armstrong? Uh, yeah, you know, my, my father has always uh, insisted to me that I have to write three of them. <laughs> <laughs> like, God, yeah, I like it. Good, three nice numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I say, well, that's easy for you to say. Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> as you can imagine, it takes a lot of work. This, this Louis Armstrong, New Orleans took a lot of work. I mean, it's a it's a... It's a, a, a thoroughly researched book, and, and it has something like uh, 1,500 endnotes telling people where I got this information and so forth. Um, but I am writing another book on, on Louis Armstrong, and I haven't picked the title of it yet, but it's going to be on the 1920s and 1930s. Wow. And so it's going to cover you know those glory years of when he's really sailing. 
Yeah, but I'm not sure if there will be another one after that. <laughs> I mean, you know what? I, I I just really appreciate your work a lot because, like, I got Thank both you. of your books by accident. It's like, uh-huh. no, nah, I don't think it was, it was by design, you know, uh-huh. that I get these books because, like, I wasn't even looking for your books, but it just, like, it kind of found me. I think books always, books call you, you don't pick them to pick you. <laughs> and, like, the thing about I love about, like, New, Louis Armstrong, New Orleans, is that you make it such a point to really talk about the background of the music. I think sometimes when Winter Marcellus or Stanley Crouch, they forget or they don't want to acknowledge mm. is that the same culture they, they kind of lambast or, you know, whatever, like scorn and ridicule, mm. it has a long tradition. Like you talk about Kirk Wade, the most famous New Orleans pimp, or you talk about the fact that Louis Armstrong had, a, you know, a lot of these musicians had pimping in their background. They yeah. had, you know, they, they lived a fast life. Like, you know, people forget that Ragtime came out the brothels and the whorehouses. In sporting places, like, you know, before it became so legitimate, or whatever you want to call it. Because I remember my problem with jazz before I got to college was that that jazz was very elitist. That it wasn't for the people or by the people. Yeah. That you had to be a sophisticated, you know, one of the intelligent, you know, people yeah. that know all the philosophy. And then I figured out that, you know, this came from the semi-literate enslaved folks. Louis Armstrong, you know what I'm saying, uh, predecessor, you know what I'm saying, like, Express out the plantation. I think you just did such a beautiful job of connecting jazz, like, you know, uh, homegrown, grassroots beginning. Gosh, thank you so much. I mean, that's that's exactly what I'm trying to accomplish here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really good point you make about what jazz has become today, which is would pretty much be unrecognizable to the people 100 years ago in New Orleans mm-hmm. who, who created this music. And And, yes, what I'm trying to do is tie it into... Uh, what I call a vernacular African American culture, the culture of lower class people, working class people, and an orally based culture. That's what I, that's what I mean by vernacular. Mm-hmm. Uh, orally based is carried by the common people. It's not an elitist. It's not a top down kind of culture. It's a, it's a culture that emerges from the people and, and it's carried by the people orally in an oral tradition. So nothing that Louis Armstrong learned until he was 18 years old had anything to do with musical notation, for example. Mm-hmm. And the and so and just to carry on the, the the larger point there, and so what I'm trying to do is relate that culture to the culture that came out of slavery, mm-hmm. and and was was carried to New Orleans by the some forty thousand people who migrated from the slave plantations, the former slave plantations of Louisiana and Mississippi. Some forty thousand people came to New Orleans in the late decades of the nineteenth century. A lot of people don't realize this. This mm. is one of the one of the real distinctive things about New Orleans is that it became a center of migration. And we talk about the Great Migration, you know, and, and we usually think of it as from south to north. But this is right. really the first stage of the Great Migration. Is an uh, um, within the South people moving from the plantations to the cities. And it didn't happen just in New Orleans. It happened in all the cities in, of the South. Atlanta, that's when, you know, black population of Atlanta exploded, and uh, Birmingham. I mean, it's, it's the same all throughout the South. Mm. Um, Memphis. Um, but that's really the first stage of the Great Migration, and that is what leads to jazz. That's what creates the birth of jazz in New Orleans. I mean, there are other things, that, as you know from the book, that I argue that have to do with why jazz happened in New Orleans and not, not in Atlanta or Charleston or you know, any other number of places that could have. It's, it's interesting. Why didn't jazz happen in any of those places? Why did it only happen in New Orleans? It's because New Orleans has a lot of special things about it. But the key for me is this migration from the bring these people uh, they're coming from the plantations of Louisiana and Mississippi which have at that time very very high rates of african culture uh, the african cultural legacy is very very strong at those places and why is it so strong um is for one reason is because of the ratio of blacks to whites the very very high ratios another reason is that those um, illegal slaves were brought in through New Orleans long after uh, the slave trade was abolished. The, the mm. transatlantic slave trade was abolished. Illegal slaves are brought in through New Orleans from the Caribbean uh, and from directly from Africa. And uh, so there, the, the African presence in, in these huge plantations, the sugar plantations, cotton plantations of Louisiana, Mississippi, is, is very strong. And it manifests in dancing, it manifests in religion. Uh, it manifests in speaking styles. 
uh, and of course it manifests in music. And all that is coming into the city in 1880s, 1890s. That Louis Armstrong's mother is coming from a, a former slave plantation at age 15 in the year 1900. Uh, Joe, Joe Oliver, his mentor, the same thing, comes, I mean, dozens and dozens and dozens of these musicians. So it's important to recognize, I think, where this music came from. Who, who were the people who actually created this music and created a culture that could support it, that supported it, you know, to an extent where there wasn't just one great trumpeter, there wasn't just Boldy, Buddy Bolden or just mm -hmm. Joe Oliver, there were dozens of great mm -hmm. trumpeters. And, and there was enough interest and support for it that in, if in the black community that, that this music uh, got going. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, like, I want to touch the base. Like, I'm glad you brought up those points about where this music came from because you, know, you made a great analysis of the Creole versus the ratty people tradition of the black people. You know, they uh -huh. considered, like, you know, it's crazy. Like, you know, the Creoles considered, like, even though these black folks came out the plantation and were living in New Orleans, they were still the out-of-towners or the foreigners. A lot of xenophobia. I guess it was like cultural xenophobia. Yeah. I mean, it's weird. It's like I, I want you to address that, you know, for our listeners, so they can know well, how this, you know, uh -huh. why New Orleans, why jazz had to happen there. Based yeah. on their rivalry. I, I I try to make a lot of arguments about the Creoles. You know, the famous Creoles of New Orleans. Um, it may be a little too argumentative, but the reason I do it is because the Creoles have been very huge in the legends of jazz. And there's been a lot of misunderstanding about what their role was. In the first place, they had a really strong musical tradition, but it was what I call Eurocentric. It was totally French. It was totally connected to the French Opera House in New Orleans. It was connected to uh, the Paris Conservatoire, actually. Some of these mm -hmm. Creole of color musicians went to Paris and took mm -hmm. lessons. I mean, they had access to this tradition. Someone like Armstrong had no chance in, in, of any uh, of gaining access to that kind of tutorial. But these Creoles did. And so it's for that reason, one of, that's one of the reasons that their role in jazz has been misunderstood. Now that's an important part of the musical scene that's going on there, is this kind of command of brass instruments and of clarinets. Uh, you know, this kind of tech technical command and, and understanding of European scales and theory and chords and so forth. And they brought that, they had that, they had that very strong. And Armstrong grew up uh, being aware of who these people were. And, and you know, they're, they're very strong presence in parades, especially. He, he knows them through parades. But my argument is that they really had very little to do. They were not the creators of jazz. The creators of jazz came from the other side of what Canal Street is the big dividing line for, for ethnicity at this time in New Orleans. It still is today, in fact. But... Um, they came from Armstrong's side of Canal Street, which is where the 40,000 immigrants from the plantation settled. So, so there's this dynamic going on, you know, between the, the plantation culture, the vernacular culture of African Americans with its strong African legacies, and these Creoles who had these, who knew all about the instruments and knew about how to play them and knew about European scales and so forth and had that knowledge. And, and Armstrong does eventually find, get to a level where he can play with those people and learn from them. And that's part of the story, actually. All right, it's interesting. Like, you did such a great job. Cause, I mean, I, when, I, when I was reading about the, like, you're talking about the Great Divide of Canal Street mm -hmm. and how black people was restricted in their movement, mm -hmm. what came to my mind was a quote, I'm paraphrasing Charlie Parker, when he said that in music they teach you there's boundary lines, then art there are no boundaries. Uh-huh. You know, like the fact you say, you know, by them learning the music and they're able to be able to participate in the parade or whole of musicians, like uh -huh. musicians, like it allowed them to travel to places that they could not even think uh -huh. about going. Uh -huh. And like it ties up to what Black Benny told Louis Armstrong about, you know what I'm saying? Get somebody that support and believe in what your art is. Yeah. And then it, like it basically led them to around the world, you know, yeah. Yeah. practicing his art form. But I like to say Sidney Bechet and Freddie Kemper are very interesting Creoles. Yeah. So they embraced the black vernacular. Like, I mean, I remember when I read Tiddy Mache's autobiography, uh -huh. Treated Gentle. And I thought it was interesting. Like, he said one of the reasons he moved to Paris was to be closer to Africa. Uh -huh. So why, and the only thing about Tiddy Mache and Freddie Kepper, like how they basically rebelled against the so-called Creole music tradition. Yeah, you're right. You're right. They sure did. And Bechet's autobiography is a wonderful book. Very problematic, mm -hmm. however, I must say, um, mm -hmm. because it was heavily edited. Uh, unlike unlike Armstrong's, it was it was dictated through a tape recorder, 
and we don't have those tapes anymore, but we do wow. know that it went through two series of editings, and we do know that the editing was pretty heavy. We also know that Bechet invented a lot of his biography, actually, and just made it up. <laughs> oh, okay. He got creative imagination. <laughs> he, he, he actually <laughs> read. I mean, was he literate? Like, he I, you know, read? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that he was literate. I'm not sure mm. that he was. And, and, you know, a lot of work needs to be done on Bechet. He, I, when I, in fact, when I started this book, I thought I was going to do sort of Armstrong and Bechet both as sort of a dialogue kind of thing going on. But then I realized there was so much to do in Armstrong that I just went ahead and did this. But I would love to see somebody do uh, something like what I did for Bechet. It would be a great story. Um, but, yes, you're right. He, he did do that. Uh, it wasn't that he did that always, though, and Keppard was even uh, more the other way. Keppard, even though he learned to play jazz and learned what we think of as, as African-American music, uh, mm-hmm. he was pretty snobby against people who were, had darker skin than he had. Mm-hmm. And, and he actually was pretty exclusionary. Uh, and when he was in Chicago, for example, this was after Armstrong and many, many other musicians had moved to Chicago, uh, Keppard liked to, to speak French among the Creoles uh, just to keep you know, that little exclusionary boundary going. So he was, <laughs> yeah. It, he has a complicated relationship to this music, and and yes, he did he did embrace it at a certain level, but he also was not exactly, um, you know, integrated with this group of people. Yeah, I thought it was interesting. Like I was thinking about Louis Armstrong's wife, Lil Hardin Armstrong. She did an interview yeah. back in the '60s. I mean, yes. it's like I discovered it on RedHotJazz.com. Yes, it just blew me away because you said like Freddie Kemper was basically her favorite, you know outside of Louis, uh-huh. trumpet player then, like uh-huh. Earl Morton said, that he was the best, because I guess it's based on him, him being Creoles. Uh-huh. And, like, I was like, you know, the touch, like, when you had put in that book these powerful imagery, like the words with the image, like, just looking at, like, Joe Oliver sitting down with Louis Armstrong on him, and then looking at Freddie Kelford sitting uh-huh. down with Sidney Bechet, that was such a powerful statement to me. Oh, thank to you. help those images there, because it, it means like an apprenticeship, a mentorship. Yeah. And what they eventually became, you know, they, they eventually became better and greater than their than their so-called mentors. It's like well, I think Picasso said at one time, "You must kill your father." <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, people don't understand the yeah. reality. Yeah. You must, you know, because like Little Hart and Armstrong, you probably I know you heard the interview. Like she was saying how she said that Joe Oliver Leslie told her that as long as he kept Louis Armstrong as the second cornet, you know, what I'm saying in this group, he could never be greater than him. Like, yeah. he knew that Lewis was better than him because the fact, like, you're coming with the recording, he had to stand 20 feet behind everybody else because he was so yeah. loud. Yeah. You know, yeah. he had this yeah. big personality came out of his horn. So yeah. let me ask you about that. What do you think about that, you know, killing your father become greater? I, th- I, think it's, I think it's really fascinating. You know, the, the relationship of Armstrong to Oliver is really important, um, you know, and, and it's been controversial because some people think that, Armstrong's such a different player than Oliver was that, mm-hmm. you know, how much could he have actually learned from him, you know, and so forth. There's been that kind of discussion. A lot of that gets confused because by the time Oliver got recorded, he really was not playing the way he was in his prime because he had gum disease. He had a pyorrhea. He and, loved sweets, right? He loved candy. Yeah, exactly. It, it, mm-hmm. Eating all this sugar water, drinking sugar water constantly, yeah. And, um, and yeah, chewing tobacco, I don't know if that has anything to do with it. <laughs> those, those are the two <laughs> things that he was famous for, actually. He didn't drink alcohol, by the way, which, which had a lot to do with Armstrong's uh, disdain for alcohol. Uh, and he, as not that Armstrong did. Armstrong did drink alcohol, but not very much. He, he was more... You know, he wasn't afraid of Kepler that we were trying to say on Sidney Mache. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Um, but yeah, but I, I think Armstrong is quite clear that Oliver is the, was his mentor, and Oliver is the one he learned everything from. Uh, I mean, it, to the extent that he ignores other influences on him, like Buddy Petit, for example, was an oh, yeah. influence, and uh, there are other cornetists, Kid um, Rene and uh, Chris Kelly. I mean, there are other people who were around in the late teens who probably influenced Armstrong, but, I mean, he was devoted to Oliver, actually. And, and it is interesting, yeah, I mean, it's quite clear what you say, the story, that, and that, that is a great recording with Lil Hart, and I agree, and you can hear the whole thing online, mm-hmm. as you mentioned, at Red Hot Jazz. But um, it, it's, it's interesting that, you know, Oliver was definitely trying to hold him back, and Oliver was depending on him, because, he, you know, he did have gum disease, and his, he wasn't playing as strong as he used to play, and so he couldn't play as long as he used to play, and so forth. 
and but it's, it, it must have been clear to everybody at a certain point that uh, Armstrong was going to have to leave, <laughs> and and have to go in a in a different direction than Oliver went actually. So so it's not that he's totally um, dependent on Oliver's model, but that was definitely the strongest model. And as you say, um, as a mentor, Oliver was extremely important in in the 19 teens. Oliver really takes him under his wing in a way that was unusual. Oliver had no other uh, students that like that and, uh, you know, sets him up with jobs and gives him a trumpet at one point and, you know, shows him how to do things and really just shows him the way around. So it's it's very important. I mean, this is, I, mean like, I think he just did a great job of illustrating that. I mean, like in the book, I wish, I mean, if you need to read Louis Armstrong, do all this as well as the – you know, in his own words, because I think it just, you really tell a great story. And what I love about your writing and what you do, you tell it like it is, like, I wish that they really taught the Bible the way you wrote about Louis Armstrong. Because <laughs> it lets you know, I mean, since you make it, you put a human, like, faith on the guy. Like, his mom was a prostitute, so was Richard Pryor's mama. Uh-huh. Jane Brown, he grew up in the whole house, too, you know. Yeah. All these guys grew up in, like, what you said, like, places where, People might want to call child services on you, but at the yeah. same time, it was like such an understanding of community. Like, you no, know, Richard Pryor said that although his, you know, grandma was, a, you know, his grandma was a pimp, a madam, mm. she made sure he went to church every Sunday. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like, I look at Louis Armstrong, like the prostitute, like he told me how to, you know, they used to sit on his lap or he sat on their lap and he played his horn, whatever. It's like he was raised by a village that really looked out for everybody. Yeah. And then, like the name we came from, like the battlefield. Wow. What a what a place to live in. Yes, yes. You know, but at the same time, like these same folks were able to give something of them, the best of what they had to him. Like you said, Joe Oliver looked out for him. Yes. And took a in. So I mean, what do you think about that village concept? Is it lost today? Oh my, yeah. I don't know if it's lost, but it's it's not the same. That's for sure. It's not the same. You know, there's two things I wanted to say about what you what you're just commenting on. Um, one is that you have to realize what are the economic opportunities for people in this situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, there for men, there's day laboring, uh, you know, un, unskilled labor, and uh, for women, there's domestic work, and that's about it. So, if you want to make more money than those those things offer, you can try to you can try to be a musician, which Armstrong did. Or you can go into uh, sexual, you know, exploitation, you know, and that was a way out of those situations. Extremely limited possibilities. So there was a certain admiration for pimps who had, who had, de- who were demonstrating that they were no longer subject to the rules of white white hegemony. Um, yeah, and I agree totally that that it's a very communal situation, you know, and we see that in the church church uh, experience where, where the entire musical uh, production in church is based on a communal expression um, and that carries right through into jazz where the, 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 what's important is the total sound. This is jazz before it really became a soloist idiom and it's totally group improvisation, group feeling, group dynamics, uh, exchange between the dancers and and the musicians. There's a lot of talk about that. So yeah, there's this feeling of the group experience that that is a really important part of of who Louis Armstrong is, I think. And that's why he he is so admired. Uh, it was in the 50s and 60s, I think, because he was able to express that sort of feeling of of of, of warmth and and sociability on his, in his stage persona, actually. Oh, that's awesome. I have the call in number of people is six four six six five two four five nine three. Mr. Tom Brothers, musicologist extraordinaire. Uh one of the world's greatest experts of Mr. Lewis Daniel Armstrong. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so we got a caller that's been patiently waiting. Eric code nine zero one, you are now on the air. Nine zero one? Yeah, this is Morris. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, right, what's up, Morris? How you doing, man? Hey, brother Ron, how you doing? Uh, All right. I've really, I've really been in. I, I didn't mind waiting. I've really been enjoying the uh, the uh, dialogue between you and the author of the book, and um, I. Um, it sounds like a great book, um, but w- I guess one of my questions was, I kind of came in um, on the middle and in the middle of the conversation. I didn't catch you right from the start. So one of my questions that I've always been curious about uh, Louis Armstrong is how did he feel about what 
he what what people perceive him as being with as far as the you know people accusing him of of timing and 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 you know these these other derogatory terms attached to him how did he really feel about that and um mm-hmm. i was trying to remember the song that dave brubeck uh wrote for him that he sang differently than they thought he would uh uh-huh. um uh-huh. and uh those are my two questions yeah i think um you know the the uncle tom accusations in the 1960s during the period of uh black nationalism is when that comes up i think um well it comes up i mean as early as the late 1940s i guess uh okay. and bebop the musicians are trying to establish their distance from an older way of of african american entertainment and they they're trying right. they're trying to say you know that those ways are not acceptable to us anymore and at that same time louis armstrong is appearing in a lot of films in which mm-hmm. he's taking he's taking very uh retrogressive um uh roles you know, sitting on a, a cotton bale, for example, singing when it's sleepy time down south, this kind of romanticized vision of what the south was like. Right, right. And, and, and that, you know, that to them is, is really, uh, really bad news. And, and so they speak out against it. Yeah, and understandably so. I, I would point out, though, that, you know, he never had that kind of – he escaped all those kind of images until that period when he started well, to play more and more roles in movies. And that was where right, he kind of gets right. trapped by that image. Well, isn't uh, Sleepy Time Down South, isn't that, wasn't that his favorite song? Yes, yes, he said that at some point, <laughs> that it was his favorite song, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I just, I guess, I, I guess this is so interesting because, you know, I was, I told some people when the Ken Burns jazz thing came out that, and then I, I had started to study some things on him before that, but when I was a kid, I just thought he was a funny old guy with a, yeah. with a funny voice. I yeah. never knew yeah. that he was the genius that, that he he yeah. really was, yeah. but I was just curious about that. I was just curious how he really felt about um, the people, you know, the younger musicians um, making those accusations. Well, he he deeply course. resented it. He deeply yeah. resented it, and and there was a lot of animosity between him and Bebop. I mean, he he spoke against Bebop in many different ways and in many different times. He eventually became very good friends with Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, and they had a really warm relationship, and Gillespie apparently moved to Queens just so he could okay. be just so he could be near Armstrong, actually, <laughs> in in the fifties. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, and and so I mean, but and there were, and he wrote about it in the sixties. You know, his resentment at, at, at about black nationalists. You know, who he calls them overeducated fools who who you know, don't, <laughs> don't don't have any any sense of of what life is like. I mean, you, you do get the feeling like. You know, he, they don't realize what I had to go through. It's that kind of thing. Right, right, position. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I really appreciate you writing the book. I'm not going to okay. take up any more time. I'm going to let someone else call in. But I, I really appreciate you calling. I, I, oh, sure. I, I really appreciate that because I think that um, there there needs to be um, there needs to be a lot more um, information um, dispensed on, on uh, Louis Armstrong because he really was a genius, and I think, that uh, I've seen Cabin in the Sky and, you know, the, the, yeah. the, and the other movies that he did where they um, had him with the little devil twist right, in right. his hair and that kind of thing and and uh, some other um, derogatory movies, I think Going My Way or something, and, and uh, where he had to play those roles. But everybody did. So, I mean, yes. you know, he wasn't the only one. So I just... <laughs> Just really appreciate it, and thanks for uh, letting me um, get through. Thanks, oh, brother. Brother Moore, thanks for waiting on the line for so long. Oh, uh, oh, no man. problem, brother Ron. I'm really enjoying this, man. You really, you really <laughs> have some, some 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 real excellent um, guests on the show, and uh, I'm a you know I'm a historian, you know, uh, in my heart. So I always love anything about history, and and you know I have people in New Orleans, so I've been in New Orleans a thousand times, so. Well, let me know what you think of the book if you get a chance to read it. it just came I out sure will. I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that I uh, that I pick that up. I'm gonna I'm gonna do that because I uh, I'm really curious to see what his real thoughts were. I've always heard what other people had to say about him, but I'm curious yeah. to see what his his real thoughts were. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, thanks thank you, a brother, lot. Uh, thank you. Okay. Bye. And Mr. Uh, brothers, brother Tom, brothers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I have to address something. I think this is interesting. I, you know, I know Oprah had this two-day summit on hip-hop culture, 
And I just love the fact that you made a point that Louis Armstrong smoked weed every day. <laughs> Smoke weed every day. <laughs> and the thing about it, he said that was an insulate against racism. Yeah. And, like, I think it's so interesting because nothing's new on this song. Like, you listen to some of the old jazz songs. Like, you know, they're talking about the vapors and weed head and vibe. You know, yeah. Yeah. they're making songs about smoking weed. Yeah. And, like, no, and then you look at some of the stuff from the 20s and 30s, some of the blues. Like, I think about Robert Johnson's lyric. He said, you squeeze my limb and let the juice run down my leg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is back in the 30s and stuff. So, like, you know, it's weird to me that folks are so disconnected from the past. Like, yeah. you don't understand that this is nothing new. Yeah. What's going on with the hip-hop culture or the gangster rap or all this other stuff. Yes. This existed for a long, long time. Can you, I mean, the fact that you, like, I love how you, that's why I said it was so important for me how he tied in Louis Armstrong's environment, like the fact that he did marry a prostitute. So you can yep. throw bricks at him when she yep. got mad. Yep. Daisy Parker. They, you know, he did idolize certain people like Clerk Wade's of the yes. world. Like, there's yes. like a Bishop Don Juan here today. Yes. Or Iceberg Slim. Yes. So, like, I mean, like, you know, what can we do to help, like, the hip hop heads understand the connection that they have to jazz? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, about the marijuana, you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing. The marijuana was maybe not as strong. <laughs> <laughs> it was like natural, right? real more than that, like most like grass. It's like really grass, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the other thing to say about that is um, that we're talking about someone who uh, was a high, high professional and never missed a day of work in his life, you know, mm -hmm. a highly responsible person who who made, yeah, who had this habit, had this relationship with this with this drug, but um, you know, it's it, 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 he saw it as something that enabled his life. He didn't see it as something that um, crippled him in any way. Mm -hmm. And and he had a he had a sense, he wrote about marijuana actually he, actually he wrote a lot more about marijuana that hasn't been published yet. <laughs> you uh, gonna, I know you're gonna do the book, right? I'm like, hoping to. I'm hoping. <laughs> I hope to, you yeah. do too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's it's pretty fascinating actually. Um, but uh, yeah, he loved marijuana. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and I thought the time like the thing too is like uh, this is like this the the, the fact that you know, how the jazz musicians had, like, such a special connection with gangsters. Like, you know, Al Capone owned yes. a lot of clubs where all these jazz musicians played at, you know, like uh, like Louis Armstrong and Father Hines, one of his close collaborators yes. in the 20s. And, like, also, like, you look at the Cotton Club was owned by Oni Madden, yes. you know, the famous gangster called The Killer who became the unofficial mayor of Hot Springs yes. later on in life. But it's like he gave Duke Elton his first big break at the right. Cotton Club. Right. And, like, I'm saying, like, what is that? I mean, you look at Kansas City, it was run by gangsters, you yes. know. Uh, Count Basin out there. It was like a story of Count Basin had to play for two weeks for free because he pissed off one of these real badass gangster <laughs> uh -huh, guys. Uh -huh. So can you really touch on that a little bit, like the fact that Louis Armstrong had to leave the country because all these gangsters were trying to, you know, kill for his services, literally? Yeah, you know, that whole gangster era with Prohibition, you know, it was the mm -hmm. Prohibition era mainly that we're talking about uh, when Prohibition was in place and, and uh, you know, gangsters were running all this illegal liquor kind of thing. And yeah, it was. It was. The musicians had felt two ways about that. On the one hand, uh, they could make a lot of money from the gangsters. The gangsters often tipped very well, uh, mm -hmm. and the gangsters were really in favor of the music. I mean, they promoted it and they, they paid well and so forth. But they were also very controlling. <laughs> you know, you, you didn't really, you didn't easily go against the gangsters if if they wanted you to do something. You really mm -hmm. had had difficulty um, getting out of it. And and yes, as you say, uh, at some point Armstrong's. Had to re did leave the country because um, to get a, to escape a sort of gangster feud over who was going to control him in management and and that was one of the reasons that he was so grateful to Joe Glazer because who was eventually his manager beginning in the mid 1930s until the end of his life uh, he was extremely grateful to Glazer because Glazer really straightened that mess out and and he also felt that Glazer. Uh, was very savvy about promoting him in, in a way, you know, kept his career going mm -hmm. in, in a way that, that was unusual. You know, you have to admit, how many popular entertainers last as long as Louis Armstrong did? And and you can say that's partly because of his genius, but it was also because he was promoted well and, and Glazer had a good sense of how to how to position him in a changing market. So was Glazer also connected with Al Capone? Uh, Al yes, Al yes, yes, indeed he was, yes. Okay. And I also like I like to touch on that. I think it's interesting, like the fact that Louis Armstrong back in 1964 knocked out the Beatles with "Hello Dolly." Yeah, Hello yeah. Dolly. Yeah, that is that is something. I mean, like you know, like you said, like Joe Glazer. I think in a lot of ways, 
Louis Armstrong really, you know, he really is a great example of what happens when you follow your desires and your passion. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, even if you were scared, because he was very real. I mean, Joe Oliver enabled him to leave New Orleans because he was going to leave. And what would happen if Joe Oliver never did call Louis Armstrong to Chicago? You think right. we know about Louis Armstrong today? Or Joe Glacier yeah. doing the things that he did? Yeah. Or Leo Hart and Armstrong. This is what I love. Like, mm. you made such a great point why New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz. Mm -hmm. The horn. Yes. The brass. We might not have no Charlie Parker or Leslie Young. I mean, Leslie Young played in New Orleans. He played for King Oliver, of all people. Yes, you're right. Boy. Charlie, I mean, like the horns. Like, well, why would jazz history be different in your mind ah, boy, if the brass know. never got involved? Cause, I mean, St. Louis was about ragtime and pianos and stuff and banjos. You know, Ron, um, before, uh, that makes me want to uh, remind me of something I wanted to say. I just want to make sure I get it in here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to, you know, as, as you can imagine, I'm very fond of New Orleans. And, um, I mean, I want to just urge all your listeners, if they haven't been to New Orleans, it's a great time to go to New Orleans. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and uh, they, can, they can use all the support that they can get down there. And mm -hmm. uh, there's still a lot of great music happening in New Orleans. And uh, New Orleans is not going to be the same as it was, mm -hmm. that's for sure. But it, it mm -hmm. will come back, and it will come back in some form. And uh, just, uh, you know, I just urge everybody, a jazz festival, I think, is, is about to happen. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's the jazz, annual jazz festival, jazz and heritage festival is a fantastic mm -hmm. event, just fantastic. And every summer they have a Louis Armstrong festival around Armstrong's birth around August 4th. You can look for that. And they've got a lot of good musical things all throughout the year. Of course, there's Mardi Gras, but there are other things, you know. So, I mean, New Orleans is a special place, has always been a special place. It won't be the same. It's not going to continue to be the same. That's, that's, uh, that's clear. But it, it's going to come back, and I just wanted to put that plug in. Yeah, I mean, do you know what it means? You miss New Orleans? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was blessed to go down to New Orleans in 2001. Uh-huh. And when I walked down the French Quarter and stuff like that, I said, this is why I know jazz came from this place. Yeah. The characters you met on the street. Yeah. As well as, like, the street musicians and the love and the passion. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It was room for everybody to do their thing. Like, oh, people yeah. are so unique. I mean, like, it's just, like, I can understand. Like, and also, like, I love the way how you illustrated that it wasn't just art for art's sake. Like, you know, you had the folks come out to plantations and whatnot. This was a form of therapy. It's like, I, I keep on thinking about the stories about lead belly. Mm -hmm. who made a song for the governor of Louisiana called, you know, O.K. Allen. And he made a song, he got himself out, he, he paid for his freedom by, you know, creating some music. Uh -huh. And I think in a lot of ways that, you know, people don't understand, like, art is not just a luxury, it's a necessity. Yes, yes. You know, so like, music suits the savage beast. I agree. And without art, I don't know what we'll be, right? I mean, I know it's like things look terrible, but like what Louis Armstrong said, yeah. It's a wonderful word. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I, I agree, and I think these people 100 years ago who, were, who I'm studying and writing about um, place a very, very high value on music, um, much higher than most people do today. I think, mm. we, I think that's a loss in the United States today. I, I don't think we value music as much as people used to value it, and especially these people I'm talking about in this book, these poor black people, who uh, you know lived a very meager existence, but they had music and they they loved music and it was around them all, almost all the time. I mean, there's stories. You know, parades come by and people come out of their places of where they work and they hang out in the street for a half an hour, where, mm -hmm. while this while this parade stops and they have a little competition between some musicians. You know, setting up right there in the street. I mean, this is happening on a day by day basis. Mm -hmm. Or you know, you go to dances are happening every night of the week. I mean, dances aren't happening every night of the week in most towns where in the United States, you know. And uh, and church, there's music in church. Everybody is making music in church. It's not just the choir who's making music in church. Everybody is making music. You know, everybody's supposed to participate. It's a very, very high value placed on music, and that's the kind of culture that gave birth to jazz and gave birth to Louis Armstrong. So, um, you know, I, I just, I wish that we, we could value music more. I mean, I, people like music, you know, but it's not the same. There's not, there's not as many people playing music. This is one thing where I really agree with Wynton Marsalis, you know, in order to have a strong jazz culture, 
we have to have lots of people playing jazz at all mm-hmm. levels, you know, and we have to have lots of people going out to the clubs and appreciating, you know, the different levels of musicians, not just the great musicians, not just the Lincoln Center people, but but at all levels, you know, people in your community today are playing jazz and, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and they need support too. I like the fact that you made a point like, a lot of like the jazz is more, like you said, it's more, it's about self-expression. Like, express yourself. You can do it. Yeah. And people was very encouraging. It's like, you know, at the same time, you, like you said, uh, you talk about the vibrato. Uh-huh. The tone. It's not necessary by, like, I'm on Niles and his line of notes for uh, Sketches of Spain. Uh-huh. So I had him made a point to my house. Like, he had classical trained musicians. And, you know, Miles with the Juilliard. And he understood chords and stuff like that. But they were putting too much of an emphasis of getting every note right. Uh-huh. And he liked the slurs and the missteps. And that's the beauty. It's like, to me, all great art is made by accident. Mm. It's just happy little mistakes. That's yes. how you do innovation. You know, you don't, it's like, you know, the guy didn't leave that sandwich out or whoever left the sandwich out and got penicillin on it. I don't know how we would discover penicillin. I mean, I don't know if that's the right way. I don't know if that's correct what I said, but it's like a lot of things happen by accident. Absolutely. A lot of so-called discoveries. In, in this culture we're talking about, Louis Armstrong, Strong's New Orleans 100 years ago, uh, there's a high value placed on uh, spontaneity and mm-hmm. invention and invention. Mm-hmm. So that, that everybody has, uh, you know, all these musicians, they tried to have their own way of doing things. They, they say this a lot. You know, it was, yes, you copied somebody else. You, you learned his style, and then you tried to put your own thing in there, you know. You tried mm-hmm. to do it your own way. You tried to put your own little twist on it. There's a high r- value placed on that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Mr. Brothers, how can we, what's the best way to get in touch with you or to also buy your books? Uh, to buy the book? Yeah, buy the book. So what can we do to pro- promote you? Or, <laughs> I mean, is, I mean I'm, I'm serious. Like, to me, yeah, the work you're doing sometimes is a thankless job, but I thank God for people like you. Well, I really appreciate your, your close no, I'm reading. I'm serious, man. I mean, you just well, doing like, you know, such I, important work. I really appreciate you having me on your show, and I really appreciate how closely you read the book, actually. I really do. And, um, you know, I, I mean, it's just wonderful. I, I just enjoy this opportunity, and... Um, like I, like I say, it's in paperback now, so uh, I hope it's more accessible to more people. And and I'm particularly interested, you know, in getting it out to the black community. The black community yeah, know about you, this book, you. and and because uh, you know, I, and since I'm writing this for the black community, I mean, it's this is a part of black history, a really important part of black history that that I think is not fully fully understood and fully recognized. So so I really appreciate it, Ron. I really do. And Mr. Brother, we're going to have you have you back on the show. You open, come back on the show. <laughs> that would be wonderful. I, I need to do a lot of shows. I just, you just need to have your own special show with me. That would be wonderful. Talk about this. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take you. I got this recorded now. Well, well you, <laughs> keep, you keep in touch, okay? I, I will. And thanks a lot. You got any words of advice? Like, I'm glad you said get this out to the black community because that's the thing. I wish Oprah would put this type of stuff on. Yeah, I know. You know what I mean? Put you on. I mean, but, yeah. hey, you know, the way the system is. Knowledge yeah. is true. True knowledge is actual power. Yeah. So, you know, the only way you keep power is by keeping people ignorant. Yeah, well, we do. We just got to do what we can, you know. I appreciate what you're doing, Ron. Well, Mr. Brother, I appreciate you, man. We'll okay. be more than happy to have you on again. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brother. We keep in touch then. Uh, we are going to keep in touch. Okay. Yes, sir. All right, bye now. All right. And that does it for this edition of We All Be Radio. Thanks a lot for everybody that listened and turned in today as well as Pose your own questions and, you know, everything else. And like I said before, I can't be me without you. So we all be. That's why we all be. 